G'day and welcome to Pello Talk Live. It's hashtag not Q and A. Uh, welcome to the show. And tonight we've got a big one. Well, our hearts are breaking, and and they should be. Uh, there was uh, some really good commentary today from Ben Shapiro, which said uh, that there there are three things we should all agree on. One, that the uh, murder of uh, the African American man in America at the hands of police was a murder. It was brutal. It was unjust. It was terribly wrong. And, and that policeman should not only be fired, but face the full brunt of the law based on, on the evidence. Um, two, that rioting, looting, mayhem and destruction are uh, never a, a good plan for anything. And three, that most of us agree with one and two. And if we can't agree on all of those things, um, then we're in a whole lot of trouble. But there's a whole lot of people who aren't agreeing with that, uh, with some of those things. Uh, in, anyway, to introduce tonight's panel, uh, let me uh, read their Twitter bios, which is always what I like to do. Uh, we have the privilege of having Warren Mundine joining us tonight. Warren Mundine is, uh, hasn't mentioned it in his uh, Twitter bio, author, business advisor, Bunjalung, oh, I'm not going to have a chance of pronouncing that, sorry, Bunjalung. Warren. <laughs> uh, and uh, he has three books he wants you to buy. Um, but he's also the former president of the uh, National Labor Party uh, and uh, also a Liberal Party federal candidate. Welcome to the show, Warren. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad, very happy to be here. And uh, we also have Jacinta Price joining us tonight. She's an Alice Springs Town Councillor, Director of Indigenous Research at the Centre for Independent Studies and a campaigner against family violence and child sexual abuse. How are you, Jacinta? I'm, I'm doing good. Apart from a few technical issues, I'm doing all right. <laughs> well, we sorted them. That's what the 15 minutes beforehand is for. And I know, but just now I've enough. got to sit here with... With daggy studio headphones, that's all right. <laughs> oh, it just looks like you're about to record some aw awesome tracks um, tonight <laughs> instead of being on The Voice. Um, so, yeah. And we also have a, a bit of a Twitter celebrity, Alexandra Marshall. Uh, she's an IT slave as well as a farmer, writer and artist. What's an IT slave? And welcome to the show, Alexandra. Thank you very much for having me on. It's actually a computer joke. So it's to do with the relationship between master and slave computer systems. But I've had all manner of uh, antiphron me this week about how dare I use the word slave, completely missing the joke entirely. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, and of course, uh, somebody who's been on uh, Pillow Talk Live a few times, uh, one of my favorites is James McPherson, columnist for Spectator Oz and Cauldron Pool. And uh, his opinions don't reflect any organisation he works for. Welcome back, James. Hey, David. Good to be with you. And uh, so that's all of us here tonight. Uh, and uh, certainly the burning news, you don't need to be told, is that a uh, black man was brutally murdered by a police officer who was um, accused of racism and uh, I guess the question is, is there any evidence for that accusation? Because that's what people are protesting with or without evidence. Uh, let's whip around the panel. And can we start with you, Warren? Um, is, is there a basis for, for this accusation? Uh, look, it's, it is a, a serious accusation. Isn't it? Uh, when you look at the, the video, uh, you know, at, at least you've got, to, you've got to sit there and say it was a, a very cruel and brutal way for uh, for a man to die or any person to die, and he and to me, it, it just added to a number of other thing issues that have been happening around the place. Look, um, I don't know if you know. I don't know the, the, the mind of the person who did this. All I know is that it was a it was a brutal murder, and that uh, and and this and this has uh, sparked this um, this this rights across uh, uh, the, the United States. And uh, Jacinta, what are your thoughts? I'd have to agree with, with what uh, Warren said. I think sometimes, you know, when the focus is based on somebody's race, um, it takes away from the actual individual themselves. You know, it's um, 
uh, again, using identity politics as opposed to um, getting to the issue itself, uh, which uh, which absolutely is about uh, police uh, brutality. Uh, but, yeah, I guess we've yet to see the evidence that would suggest whether um, this was racially motivated or not. Uh, what obviously is evident is that this police officer did the wrong thing and uh, would hope that uh, the the law is enforced in full and and he receives what what you know the punishment that fits the crime and uh, alexandra um, what do you think of of the response in in america i mean we've seen obviously a lot of protesters flooding the streets um, how long did it take for those protests to turn into riots and how many of the protesters turned into riot, rioters? Uh, it would be impossible to say how many have turned into rioters, but certainly there appears to be two very distinct protests going on in America, a genuine protest against police brutality and racial tensions, and then there is the uh, violent, looting, criminal aspect to the... You call them protests, but this is not part of a genuine protest led by organisations like Antifa, who are always sitting there in the background attempting to turn any kind of civil unrest into a large event. So they moved straight from COVID-19 into uh, this particular incident of police brutality. And uh, they've been very successful in motivating large mobs of rioters, uh, as we can see across not just America, but it's spreading into other countries. Mm. So it, it's actually getting worse. Well... We, we know that the police officer involved, in fact, I just found out from uh, somebody tonight who was trying to persuade me that the, uh, the, the uh, I don't know what word to use other than murderous cop, um, and, and it should be an oxymoron, and unfortunately it's not, but um, she was trying to convince me he was a racist, and I'm just saying, well, I'm prepared to believe you, I just need some evidence for that. I, I happily admit he was brutal, I happily admit he's a criminal, um, I happily admit he needs to go to jail based on the evidence and the full force of the law. But um, to call him a racist and say this is proof that America's racist top to bottom beginning to end, um, you at least need to show me some evidence that he was motivated by racism. And apparently he's been charged or had 17 complaints against him. Um, and I said, well, that's great. I'm sure you've seen the evidence. Show it to me. And there was a list of complaints, um, two of them for which he was disciplined, 15 he wasn't but none of them had any details. Uh, she told me without evidence that 60% of those complaints were against African-Americans. Um, and so I said, well, what that means is you've just proven evidence that he's a brutal cop who's not exclusively brutal to African-Americans and dishes it out fairly evenly. Um, is this just a case of police brutality or is it proof that America's racist top to bottom, beginning to end. James, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the police officer's motivation is, is uh, up for debate at this point from what I've read, but it's, it's very clear that uh, the charge of murder seems to be well justified. The man was fully subdued. The police officer had his foot on the man's neck. Now, if you are going to uh, kill a man for uh, allegedly counterfeiting a $20 note, you're doing policing all wrong. Uh, the police officer only lifted his foot uh, effectively so they could put the corpse on the stretcher. Um, the real outrage here was not just the fact that a police officer murdered a man for allegedly uh, counterfeiting a $20 bill, but uh, that the police officer was allowed to walk around free for a number of days before he was arrested and charged. Well, the rest of the city was under lockdown uh, so they wouldn't catch the flu. Yeah, well, it seems um, there's going to be a lot of uh, COVID cases coming out in um, New Zealand and many other nations around the world um, lately because uh, social distancing and personal hygiene was out the window. Um, but... but uh, can, I, can I add something there to the previous comment? Please. Uh, so you guys have touched on a very good point. You have to, first of all, 
prove that the, the the police officer's actions were racist and if they were he of course you know has done absolutely terrible things that does not follow that the entirety of american culture is racist and mm. then from there it doesn't prove or follow that you should tear it down and burn it to the ground which is what we're seeing protesters calling for so there are three very mm. distinct issues that are going on here the first everyone agrees with which is the guilt of the police well, not guilt, but assumed guilt of the police officer and his actions the other two about America's position and what to do about it are uh, where a lot of the conflict is coming from and a lot of the division yeah. in this particular conversation. Mm. Yeah. Also, could I get, continue from that as well? You know, I've, I've been following uh, the Twitter, I've been following the social media, for, and, and, there's, uh, and you heard the brother of uh, uh, George Floyd uh, come out and speak as well. Uh, that and, and, you know, this whole thing seems to be hijacked, you know, that, that there seems to be a lot of people just waiting for some something to happen. Yeah. Now, this was a dreadful, uh, a dreadful crime that, that I've seen, you know, and the more and more I've watched it and I've watched it about five times and mm. the worse and worse I get uh, at the thing. So, so it looks like they said, look, okay, you can be angry about what's happened, you can protest, and, we, and look, and we live in a liberal democracy, a free society, people can peacefully protest as much as they like. Uh, but this thing where you just go out and just burn and, and loot and attack innocent people. I saw so many videos of people being bashed, shop, uh, retailers and shop owners and stuff like that. And also that uh, the police officer who was shot in, in Oakland, an African-American police officer as well. And then today you're hearing reports of four police officers who were shot in in St. Uh, Louis, uh, St. Louis, uh, Missouri, and so this is not the answer to to what is happening. And you see these people who are well organised and seem to be just out there to cause problems. So you've got two protests. You've got this peaceful uh, daytime type protest uh, uh, who are, are genuine in their approach to what happened, the brutality of uh, of what happened to the arrest, and then you see that these nighttime and, and late afternoon protests, which is turned into riots. Really. Yeah, it was um, it was a, a forged twenty dollar note um, that started it all, and and I did see footage on on Twitter of. Now, certainly after they got him out of the car, it doesn't seem to be any resistance. Um, but when they were trying to get him out of the car, it was definitely resistance going on which is zero justification for brutality, let alone criminal murder. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, this, is, this is absolutely, as you said, Warren, just spilled over completely from demanding justice to perverting justice in, in a horrific um, and just gross way. And it's really not doing the protesters any, any favours at all. If they've got a valid point to make, and they probably do, uh, then then you know that's been lost it's been destroyed and and the people who've hijacked this all um, have 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 really done nobody a service at all Jacinta you've had some experience with um, protesters making uh, a an actual injustice and an actual sincere call for justice um, all about them Tell us a little bit about that experience that happened to you last year. So um, following the the police shooting death of my nephew at a, out at Yundamu last year, um, you know, it, it, the local uh, renter protester crowd, if you like, decided to stage a protest at the front of the police station. Um, complete strangers um, <laughs> these were complete strangers who did this and uh you know having a go at our police force which is also made up of indigenous men and women and calling them racist for um a, a, one particular instance where this had taken place uh it was not beneficial um a lot of our people rely on uh our police force to support them uh, particularly as such that um, the majority of Indigenous people that are killed by other people are killed outside of custody uh, and usually by our own family members, uh, those that are closest to them. And 
so a, a good relationship between us and our police is is very important and also mm. uh my my nephew who was killed his uh his uncle is a police officer at yundamu at the community of yundamu as well so my mother and i went to the police station to um ask these protesters to not hijack this situation and make it all about them and their cause um you know and about black deaths in custody we this was my nephew um and what people don't realize is that in traditional terms i am most definitely an authority to speak on this particular issue in relation to my nephew and i was utterly disrespected uh i was yelled at by other um local aranda women and protesters who wanted to make this all about them and a cause um that they were pushing for and um there were a lot of people who decided to hijack this situation including other warbury people who are, were, are not in fact related uh because you know because that for 15 minutes they can have the limelight um and you know there's all kinds of uh issues that can arise from this situation for example things like compensation if there's been wrongdoing my fear is that there'll be those who will be fighting for compensation who are wanting uh, there with their hand out um when they don't have any right to whatsoever uh and aren't in fact closely re related enough but there's a whole raft of issues going on and you know similar to what's happened um in Minnesota the fact that 80% of the population there is uh African American yet 60% of the protesters were white and we have the same issue here in Alice Springs we have uh you know uh it's it's become an industry where white protesters have their um cause that they want to push and they will use other indigenous people to push that cause and if they've got an aboriginal person standing beside them they can point to them and say oh look this is you know this this is so and so and 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 they're part of this and we're doing this for you and it's it's disgusting it's exploitation of of mm. um disadvantaged people i want to um ask warren and jacinta um I guess I have a intellectual answer to this already, but uh, and and the question is, uh, white people will get told we actually can't tell black protesters uh, what's right and what's wrong, such as lawless rioting and looting, because we can't imagine the frustration and exasperation without their lived experience as a black person under systemic racism. So Lyle Shelton's asked a question, do you believe there is systemic racism in Australia? Let's address that question as part of what don't we know as the average white lived experience that the average black lived experience um, could give us insight on? I'm glad you got an intellectual answer to it already. Look, for, there's a lot of nonsense that is, that is spoken about. As human beings, there are basic there are basic things that all human beings uh, live by. You know, we look we we love our families, we look after ourselves, our families. We 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 work, we do things. We have, we don't steal from each other. We don't uh, physically have violence against each other. These are basic human uh, human traits and that. Uh, so this idea uh, that you don't understand justice and you don't understand uh, the, uh, you know the, what's it like in certain circumstances of course you, you don't like I don't know what it's like to be a, uh, a, an Aboriginal or, or, or a Torres Strait on a day-to-day -day basis or you don't I don't have a clue in a, in a lot of ways about how uh, Europeans and Anglo-Saxons Australians and that uh, do too but this idea that you don't understand justice you don't understand what right and wrong and that you don't have a say in, 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 in you know, about what's happening around your community, what's happening around your city, what's happening around your nation, it, it's just nonsense. You know, mm. you just look at you just look at uh, the, the, the the issues and the rights in in uh, Minnesota now, and you and you see a lot of these uh, shops that were burnt down, a lot of these buildings that are burnt down, African Americans. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, these were people who were running a shop just like a, a, an Asian person does or a, a, a European person or any other race in the world does it. They're running a shop just like anyone else. They're trying to get their businesses going. They know what it's like to, uh, to have their, uh, they know now what it's like to have their business burned down just as much as a, a white person can, can sympathise and be and understand that, that pain. Uh, this idea that you don't have a right to speak is just a load of nonsense. Uh, how do, how, you know, oh, just because I'm Aboriginal, you know, you've all got to be quiet. You've got to listen to my wisdom. And I'm, sometimes I'm pretty smart. But you've got to, <laughs> you, and you've got to be quiet and, and just accept it is, is nonsense. If, some, if someone says something you don't agree with, you have a right to say that. You, you know, and and, and as, as we were saying earlier, if you look at some of that, you know, about the brutality of what happened, we all understand that as human beings. Uh, we also all understand that uh, burning down uh, your own suburb or your own city or uh, attacking innocent people who had nothing to do with this, mm. and, and uh, 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 we all understand that is wrong. And so so this idea that you should step back and just say, oh, yeah, that's fine, let's go ahead. I just saw some nonsense reporting uh, on, on uh, the American media and even the Australian media and that about this thing of, oh, oh you know, we've got to... We've got to respect this. We've got to be, this. This was these were not peaceful uh, 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 protests. Yes, the vast majority of people were peaceful. Yes, there were. There's these two approaches: is peaceful demonstrations, and then and then these other ones, which are just violent. Uh, just uh, it's just it's it's just burning down uh, around the city. It's just and and at that I've seen some brutal things done to people who were just totally innocent. Had, had nothing to do with the brutality against uh, uh, George Floyd uh, and also any other people who had been brutalised over the years. And yet they are the ones who are in hospital. There are some people who are even dead now. Uh, so as I think we've got to get back to basically everyone has a right to have a comment. Everyone has a right uh, to, uh, to see what's going on. Everyone has a right... To, to, to uh, of understanding, and I, I believe that as human beings, we do understand when a, a, what the issue of right and wrong. Yep, absolutely. I want to uh, welcome everybody to the show again. If you've just tuned in, you can leave your comments, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube live. And uh, if they're half decent, civil and on topic, we'd gladly include them in the show, put them on the screen and maybe even have a chat about them um, amongst ourselves. Uh, you can follow me at Dave Pello on all the social media channels and that's also the website where you can get past episodes and articles and become a partner of the show to keep this going and make more of it. And a big thank you to the Pello Talk partners who are already doing that on a regular basis for as little as three bucks a month. It's uh, making a huge difference and not taxpayer funded, uh, not Q&A. <laughs> Uh, Jacinta, tell me about racism in Australia. Is it systemic? What does systemic even mean when people say that? And uh, obviously, in a population of millions of people, we're going to have uh, more than a handful of bad apples or complete jerks, um, which would include racists. Um, but does that make us a racist nation? And uh, what's the refugee camp like to leave Australia and America? We are most certainly not a racist nation. We are a very successful multicultural uh, nation. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm sick to death of people looking for co constantly on the hunt for racism and then so making, um, making things up, you know, making things mm -hmm. appear as though they're, they're racist uh, when they're in fact not. And uh, this is... This is a wonderful country full of opportunity for absolutely anyone who's prepared to take that opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think growing up in a place like Alice Springs, uh, having an Aboriginal mother and a white Australian father, uh, that was my norm and the norm for many, many kids. Um, and throughout the Northern Territory, in fact, it's, it's normal to be involved in multicultural community. And, of course, in other parts of the country too, but I find that particularly in more, um, let's say, civilised, um, if you like, um, built-up cities, that's where um, you tend to find individuals who will exacerbate something and make a big deal out of um, 
something that is particularly, you know, not 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 so relevant or pretend that there's um, all this racism about the place, and and it, and it tends to come from uh, more privileged Indigenous Australians. This argument that there's racism everywhere. I mean, uh, you know, if you take, for example, the lovely rapper Briggs, he's always carrying on about how tough it is to be Aboriginal when he's one of um, the most privileged Indigenous people in this country. And, you know, growing up, if, if the worst thing that could ever happen was he couldn't get a home loan, well, then I'd suggest that he should come to Central Australia and see how marginalised Aboriginal people whose first language is not English, how they live their lives um, and how they're struggling because they're being told by people like him and, and protesters that mm. um, assimilation is a, is a dirty word, it's an evil thing, um, so therefore don't assimilate. So therefore, in other words, don't um, grasp the tools that you need uh, in a modern world that everyone else is succeeding with and advancing with. Don't grasp those tools because then you'd be assimilating and that is mm. racism. So we, we are not a racist nation at all. And, you know, the one thing I'll say about America um, I think they do struggle with their race issues a lot more than Australia. I think we've got a lot, a lot better here in Australia. But the one thing that I will notice also from everything that's going on in the rioting is the fact that there are, there are, there is this wave of voices now coming through. Of of you know, there's you've seen the footage of the police who knelt down with the protesters mm. because they want to be part of solving this. They too believe strongly that that. Uh, you know, their colleague did the wrong thing, committed murder, and they want to be part of resolving this as much as those protesters. And there are people coming forward voicing this loudly and clearly. And hats off, you know, I saw a video of protesters who were standing in front of a business so that looters couldn't get in, risking their own lives because, of course, we've seen where people have been attacked and there's, you know, possibly someone murdered by looters. But there are protesters, you know, who are saying, look, we're here for the cause and we don't want the looting to take place. So those sorts of, you know, things are, are coming to light as well. I think during such times, this is when nations can prove that, in fact, you know, you're wrong. We're not racist and we want to resolve these issues and we want to do them together. And that's where the focus should should be put. Just into it's Michael funny. Connery, yeah, who, who's um, Michael Connery is, uh, I guess, uh, taking a contrary view to most of the commentators tonight. And, and I'm keen to, uh, you know, he's being civil, so I want to include that. He's saying, why are First Australians still asking for reconciliation if we are not racist? Well, I'm not asking for reconciliation and I know there's plenty of others who aren't asking for reconciliation because personally I feel like I'm a product of reconciliation. I've been reconciled all my life uh, and sometimes I feel as though it's a word that's used by some to control a group of others. Sometimes I feel that it is, um, it is abused in that way uh, because to me reconciliation is when everybody gets to come to the table and sit at the table and it's about generating and creating understanding uh, and um, you know that I see that happen too on a daily basis and those that would argue that, that, that that's not the case well I think it's because they don't want it to be the case they, they don't want to succeed um, in that space I mean if we decided all right well we're reconciled we wouldn't have to pour funding into attempting that would be the end of a very lucrative industry wouldn't it <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah uh, just to, just to follow up on that you know uh, one thing that really drives me mad and i always remember my father when he talks about this uh, he's passed away now but uh, he, he used to carry the dog tag with him so the first 13 years of my life i lived in a segregated society in australia uh, and that that's just the fact of, of what it was like but, you know, since those 60s, uh, things have changed. And my father always carried his dog tag. The dog tag is what Aboriginals called it. was is like a little passport that you, in New South Wales, you had to carry on you. Uh, if you were an adult and you wanted your kids to go to a, uh, to a public school, you wanted, uh, if you wanted to, uh, uh, to, to be able to uh, be exempt from the Aboriginal laws, and they used to be under what they really strange title, the Aboriginal Protection Laws that operated in New South Wales. And if you didn't have that on you, you could be arrested 
and you could be locked up and you could be uh, uh, then put back on a reserve or a mission. Uh, he, when he, in his, in his old age, uh, when young people were coming up to him, now these are young people who had the incredible advantage. You know, when I was a kid, someone said to us, if you're going to university, we would have said, what's university? You've got thousands of Aboriginals going to university now. You've got doctors and lawyers, even though I don't know if lawyers help civilization. But you have a whole wide range of people out there, engineers, uh, you know, 6,000 Aboriginals working in the mining industry from tradies right up to, uh, to superintendents of mine sites and stuff like that. So you've got this amazing... He used to get sick and tired of people and said, oh, this is a racist country, this is terrible. And he said, and he used to pull out his... He still carried it. To, in fact, we, he carried it to his grave. He wanted to be buried with it because it, he said, this is what we fought against. This is what we, uh, we wanted to be equal with. And we had a lot of Australians come together. No, and everyone forgets the 1967 referendum. Over 90 percent of Australians voted for Aboriginal people to be equal and to be together as, as citizens of this country. And, and, and my family, my older brothers and sisters demonstrated and, and, and worked with those people to do that. And he said, this is what we've moved from. You, you have great opportunities today. You don't understand fully what, you know, they talk about uh, we're, a, you know, a structural racist society. You said, you don't even know what that is because I actually lived in that period when it was. And so I always use the term, uh, I don't break a country by... It's, it's, it's beginning and, and it's past history because name me a country in the world that, that didn't have a bloody start. Name me mm. one. You'd be very, very uh, hard to find anyone uh, uh, to have that. But the real, I rate a country by how it overcome those, that bad history and moved into the future. And that's where I rate Australia very highly on. I, I, I challenge anyone that, show, that can show me a, a country like Australia with all these different cultures mm. that have come here, hundreds of different cultures that have come here, hundreds of different people have come here and, and, and built this incredible nation. Uh, I, I say to people, show me a country that is better than ours. And, and yet I have not heard anyone who can come up with another country that is better than ours. I agree completely, and, and that's my point. There's no refugee camps here in Australia or, you know, trying to get out of out of here to a, a better nation. There's no refugee camps leaving America for, for Canada. You know, people aren't queuing up to flee the persecution because, uh, you know, you, you can't... You, dead man walking if you're black in America. You know, it, just ridiculous hyperbole coming from uh, media and, and elitists uh, over there, um, which... James leads me to ask you how much has demagoguery, the manipulation and exploitation for political advantage of of people's emotions and feelings, um, been a factor in building this powder keg where there's a society that is actually being programmed to think racist, racist, you're a racist, you're a racist, you're a racist, everybody's a racist, racist from the beginning, racist to now. Um, you know, I heard somebody on ABC tonight talking about how um, we we need to uh, go back to 1770 to do proper truth telling. How much no, demagoguery? <laughs> demagoguery is the the uh, the thought I want you to um, comment on um, before you go off. Thanks. The, the great tragedy in all of this is that the more you call everything racism, the less meaning the term racism actually has. So mm. in trying to fight racism by making everything racist, you actually make nothing racist at all and defeat your very purpose. Mm. The West is far from perfect, and I think we all know that. We all acknowledge that Australia is a great country, America is a great country, and at the same time, I think we're all mature enough to realise that Australia has its problems, as does the United States. I think it's incredibly important in the midst of our present troubles that we resist these opportunistic exaggerations of those who insist that we are rotten to the core. Um, what we owe every person in our nation is a free society. And, and I don't mean a society free of bigotry because that's impossible because bigotry, if once it's eliminated from the legal system, and from uh, 
different organisations, bigotry will always exist in people's hearts. So, so we mm. can't promise people a society free of bigotry, but we can create a society where every person is equal before the law and every person has a vote. And then beyond that, we can encourage people to get on and make the best life they possibly can by being responsible for themselves, as Sunita brilliantly pointed out a moment ago. But the left don't want to address issues on a case-by-case -case basis, which is why the murder of one man becomes all of America is racist. Mm. Um, the ill treatment of a specific Indigenous person becomes Australia is racist to the core. And the reason people insist on this is that if they can say that the country is rotten to the core, they can win overarching power to re-engineer all of society. And, and this is the great paradox of leftism or, or progressivism. Uh, they always conflate our sins of the past with our present situation so that the two become indistinguishable. And so they, they claim to take us forward by looking at the present, but only ever seeing the past. And, and so whatever situation you can uh, nominate, they never deal with that specific situation. The whole thing becomes all of the country is racist. We were founded on racism. Therefore, you've got to give us power to undo everything and re-engineer all of society. And, and, and that's a tragedy that that becomes the narrative. Mm, absolutely. Um, for the viewers, uh, just a little housekeeping note to let you know that the show's going to end formally uh, just before nine o'clock, but don't go away. We're actually going to go into overtime. I'll uh, cut the video up tomorrow. Um, but uh, so stick around and uh, the first hour is the, the best hour. But uh, for those people who've got a little more endurance for a gripping conversation, um, then we're actually going to keep going uh, for as, as long as our endurance lasts, maybe an extra half hour or so anyway, uh, into nine into the nine o'clock hour. Um, so, yeah, that's stick around and you can uh, comment on Facebook and YouTube and we'll, um, if it's free of swear words and staying relatively civil, we'll um, put, it, put it in there. Alexandra, um, can you tell me about Antifa? Donald Trump has now declared it a terrorist organisation. Uh, on target or not? Well, first of all, if I can just quickly quickly go back to the other point just for a second. Sure. Um, as a child of the 80s and 90s, I didn't see in any of the groups or communities or schools racism at all. We were all taught to be colourblind when we were dealing with all of our friends and family and interactions. That was a very strong uh, moral code drilled into us. Um, but recently... Uh, in about the last five to ten years, I've noticed that the universities themselves have been encouraging racism by uh, putting everything through the lens of race. And that's pretty much the fastest way to turn a society into a raced one, to make the focus of everything race. And it's very interesting to watch that change from almost non-existent to the, every discussion point is now about race. And that has made people by far more racist in their everyday interactions, particularly online. Um, so with Antifa, uh, I've been putting some tweets up about this today. So I'll just read that one you've got on the screen now, which says, um, Antifa was set up by the Communist Party of Germany in 1932, which was partially controlled by Stalin's influence. Uh, they view fascism as the final stage of capitalism. Therefore, when they say anti-fascist, what they're actually referring to is anti-capitalist. And the modern Antifa is another subsection that was developed in the 1970s by a Maoist Persuasive Communist League, which is another German party. And there's other versions of Antifa, but they are all far left uh, communist groups with various ideologies, but they center around that. Now, they have been out there on uh, social media as they call themselves not an organized group, but they are organised in every sense of the word and that they release the same propaganda at the same times across multiple platforms. They have uh, groups of people, they have funding. It's interesting to note that a lot of their funding projects are also linked to Extinction Rebellion who are operated much the same way. So they put out posters like, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a one night riot with Molotov cocktails. 
And uh, okay. this is for the current protests. Things like kill all police, burn the city down, death to America. Um, I put a, together a resource that people can find on my Twitter, which is a selection of, of various Antifa tweets encouraging racial violence, the destruction of private property, businesses. And you see they call themselves comrades. They use the Leninist quotes. It's very much still back at its roots of where it came from. But when we're talking about the protests that are violent over in America today, we all agree on the basic foundation of the police brutality, you know, is wrong. And if there are laws that need to be changed, change the law. But the protests that have turned violent appear to be directionless. Well, I dug up some of their uh, demands that are going around, which you can see on the website. I'll read a few to you. The demands of the current violent protesters are free health care for all, no work, no paying of any debt, uh, free all prisoners, including violent prisoners, homes for everybody, including using unoccupied homes belonging to other people and giving them to anybody who wants them. Um, and yeah, just basically continuing of destruction of capitalism, burn it all, everything. So those are the demands that are being pushed through the violent protests. And obviously, nobody can meet those demands. So the violent portion of the protests are making demands that are absolutely impossible for any government to uh, move toward, which means the protests have no end. It just creates general anarchy and violence, which is pretty much step one if you want to start a little revolution which is what Antifa has been trying to do with every civil unrest from decades and decades and decades. So I don't know how many people are familiar with Antifa, but oh, it's just scrolling through the site. That riot signs, things like vote 2020, burn the uh, mother effer down. That's the kind of rhetoric. It's very violent and horrible. I mm. suggest everyone go and have a look and actually read what it is they are printing to understand what the movement really is. It's not about Black Lives Matter. It is not about justice for anybody. It is a communist movement that has taken hostage an important uh, uh, no, uh, thing to fight against and just completely taken it over. But so how only... do we know they're involved in, in these uh, riots going on in America at the moment? They post the notifications. They invite people to riot. So they spend a lot of time funding it so they have official funding pages where they have set up to collect um, the money to buy, purchase equipment to do riots. They then invite everybody via social media and organise social media events to put riots on. They are the ones who are primarily spreading these riots to other countries so they get in touch with Antifa Germany, Antifa uh, France and they set up corresponding riots in each country. Uh, and uh, if you go through them all, you can see how cleverly planned and how organised the group actually is with their social media presence, which is becoming a very strong way of uh, stirring civil unrest because nobody is countering the narrative. Nobody pulls them up and says, hang on a second, it's not Antifa or Hitler. There's the free civil democracy in the middle. Uh, and they're very clever with the way they use their catchphrases and words. So if you have no historical literacy, which unfortunately many of our uh, students coming out of university today sadly lack uh, history. It's very easy to be persuaded that everyone is Hitler except Antifa without understanding that Antifa stands for, you know, Stalinist communism, which is not exactly what most people want to stand up there and produce for America's future. And yeah, so definitely go and have a look. Can you guys hear on. this? Yeah. And you know what the worst thing is? These idiots couldn't even come up with a new idea for themselves. They have to recycle old ideas. No, and Jacinta, you're completely right about hijacking a cause. There's a whole stack of Antifa accounts with Indigenous anti Antifa Federation about using decolonisation as the way to a communist future and burning down all of America for the rights of Indigenous people, which is clearly not what they're after at all. Oh. <laughs> And also some of their stuff is complete madness, you know, because I see it in my younger days when I was in university and that as well, they, they seem to attach themselves to, to Aboriginal movements and Aboriginal uh, communities and that. And, and, he, and they used to get out there and say, oh, we're going to, you know, drive all these, you know, these these white people into the sea. We're going to, uh, you know, we're going to, you know, get your land back for you and all that. And I'm sitting there looking at them going, wait a minute, but you're white, so... 
I'm going to have to drive you back into the sea too, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. What yeah. they what's, what's interesting is the way in which Antifa has captivated our young. And, and I think Antifa is what happens when you tell an entire generation that other people's ideas are dangerous, that certain speech is toxic, and that words you don't like can wound you. Uh, you invite that generation to shut down by any means necessary ideas and speech that they don't like. When speech is talked about as a form of violence, you green light actual violence against certain types of speech. And so from that point of view, Antifa may well have its roots in communism, but it's basically now the militant wing of safe space fanaticism. Um, it, it's, if you like, the bastard child of a culture that elevates mental safety over intellectual liberty and people's feelings over public freedom. And what's frightening to me is how mainstream Antifa has become. Well, yeah. Exactly. And they're very clever. They present their arguments to other students and impressionable people as a binary. So they tell you you're either with us, you're either anti-fascist or you are literally Hitler or literally a Nazi. Yeah. And mm. that is an easy way to provoke a response from people of, oh, I don't want to be that, therefore I'm with you. It's an it's a easy recruitment tool to go on with. And that's why it's important to try and use the free speech that we have to counter the narrative to educate other people that actually you can reply with the third point, which is, no, I'm not. I'm not communist. I'm not. Uh, I'm not Hitler. I am democratic, free, capitalist society. We can have peace. We don't have to have your two particular options. And it's about training people to recognise these very basic debating tools that they use on other impressionable people to recruit members to violence. You know, it's, it's amazing how yeah. it's amazing how supportive the media are of mm. Antifa. Uh, and the media feed Antifa. The media say that if you voted for Trump, you're a hater. If you voted for Brexit, you're a racist. If you voted against same-sex marriage, you're a bigot. Um, everyone mm. who disagrees with the, the state narrative is a purveyor of hate or a white supremacist or a Nazi. And, and this has been one of the most successful acts of the cultural elite in recent decades, that the rebranding of certain political and moral worldviews as hate and therefore deserving of censorship and of punishment. And, and so really this is like the next phase of political correctness where, mm. where you can actually be assaulted for having the wrong views and the media shrug their shoulders and say, no, no, that's not violence, that's, that's just your just desserts for having the wrong view. Jacinta, what did you uh, wanted to throw in there? Look, I was just going to say that, um, you know, while this is all going on and young impressionable people are sort of being caught up in this type of behaviour, I, I also um, hold out hope and, and believe that uh, even the generation following them uh, are very likely to rebel against this sort of, you know, behaviour. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, I mean... I certainly have conversations, you know, with my own sons who uh, range from um, range from thirteen to twenty one, and um, and they look a lot at a lot of this sort of behaviour, and they just shake their head and they just they just go, what what is wrong with these people? What is wrong with these human beings? And and they certainly do not want to feel as though you know they that it's it's it's. It's, it's an act of oppression, basically, being told that, look, you're either with us, you're against us, and if you're against us, you're, you're the epitome of evil. Uh, and, and so, you know, and, and again, like going back to the point I made about what's the positive aspects that are coming out from these protests in America is that for those that have, you know, been like the quiet Australians and sat back and sort of, you know, just watched it all go on and shook their heads. They're now going, you know what, no, nah, I'm not going to have this. We're, we're not going to have this. And I think it's going to bring more power to them to to push back um, in, in far more, um, you know, thoughtful, um, responsible and caring ways against this kind of behaviour because I think, I think for many of us we've just had enough of it. Uh, and, and I do, I certainly hold hope that, 
you know, the generations to follow are going to look at this and, and just go, no, nah, don't want to borrow it. So, Jacinda, we had a uh, question. I'm just trying to find it. Here we go. Lisa Chapman. She wants to know, uh, that's a good question, so we'll just throw this in, how to do something real to help Indigenous Aussies who are disadvantaged. Uh, I might uh, in interject, is Sorry Day going to help Indigenous Aussies who are disadvantaged? Uh, but uh, Lisa continues, my kids have travelled through Australia and have played with local Indigenous and Anglo kids. They'll always know kids all kids like doing the same stuff, climbing and I, I guess uh, that comment was chopped off there, but um, you can imagine the rest of it. So she's asking um, how how can she actually help um, Indigenous people who are disadvantaged in Australia? What's, what's the solution if not all the activism and virtue signalling that we see? Well, certainly activism and virtue signalling isn't getting anywhere or, or you know, <laughs> doing anything. I think the main thing is to treat treat everyone equally the same and have the same expectations of others as you would of yourself and your own family and yourselves. But, uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of different sorts of ways that, um, you know, you can support those that are disadvantaged. And certainly, you know, education is an important one. And there's, you know, foundations like the AIEF Foundation who um, support kids to go to school. Uh, there are different, I can't remember the name of it, there's, there's a foundation in Melbourne also, which um, ensures that kids from remote communities can um, are supported in boarding schools um, in some of the cities and, and you know, in schools around Melbourne. I think education really is the key for uh, a lot of these kids. You know, if you can find out by getting hold of um, schools, you know, remote schools, if that's, you know, connect directly with a remote school and find out ways that you can support them to support their kids, I think education is most certainly the key for Indigenous kids to understand basically that they have choice in life, that they don't have to be, um, live within the parameters of, of you know, what what's just around you and um, know that there's a big wide world out there that is available to them that they can take advantage of if that's what, what they um, want to choose in life. I think they're some of the best ways. Otherwise, you know, find out how you can support uh, a women's shelter in a disadvantaged area. There's, you know, lots of different ways that you can actively, you know, be doing things to support uh, Indigenous Australians. You know, symbolism and, and virtue signalling, um, you know, doesn't work. Mm. There was a, a post on Facebook this week where a, a woman had said, you know, was talking about how, you know, I looked at my breakfast plate and I saw violence and blood. I think she had a squished tomato on her plate or something and it reminded her of her white privilege and, you know, what we should do as white people in all of this. And it's just so, oh, I, I just, you know, that to me is narcissism. It's about <laughs> appearing to be a non-racist, so to get off the hook while all this madness is going on because you're yeah. not actually doing anything really of any substance to support anybody. So if you're not going to, just be quiet. Just don't do anything. Just don't yeah. don't say, oh, I'm a non-racist. Look at me. I'm being wonderful. Just leave it. Uh, well, we all know <laughs> or, that if you deny you're a racist, that's the proof that you're a racist. <laughs> and if you apologise for being a racist, then you're obviously not a racist. Uh, Warren, <laughs> have you got any thoughts to add to uh, that question on, on how, how can... Uh, Australians who are better off uh, help those who aren't better off, especially Indigenous Australians? Well, the first thing is to stop trying to save us. Uh, we're like everyone else. We're like, you know, you know I look at my, my, my parents and that they, they, you know, they were born around the First World War. They went through the Spanish flu. They went through the Depression like everyone else. Uh, they, they, were, they were under the, the Protection Act, the New South Wales Aboriginal Protection Act all that time. They had restrictions on their life and that, but they just kept on plugging away, kept on working. What, what I've I noticed, and, and this is something we've got to, that we've got to start recognising, listening to the right voices, uh, Aboriginal, Aboriginal elders of the 1970s, when, when Aboriginals were able to access welfare payments, of course we, we had the right to do it as every citizen in Australia does, 
but they come up with the term sit down money and how they come up with the term sit down money was they, these people were were, cat, were cattlemen and cattle women and and, and, and shearers and hard workers uh, in in the rural and remote Australia and and, that, and drovers and stuff like that and they all worked. In fact, you would, if you look at the statistics, most Aboriginals worked up until the nineteen seventies and had jobs. And 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 then the government come to them in the nineteen seventies and said, uh, if you if you haven't got a job, we got we can give you money, we can pay you. And they sat there and, and they said. What, what? You, you're you going to pay us for doing nothing? And I said, yes, yes, we, you know, we can come and help you and pay you and, and help you out. And they said, what? Oh, you're going to give us money to sit here and do nothing? And and that's, and they said, yeah, this, you know, this is to help you. And they said, this is going to destroy our society. This is sit-down money. And when you see the results of that from the 1970s, at the mid 1970s onwards, you see the collapse of some of these communities, and you see the problems that happen in these communities uh, over those years because of that. You've got generations of people who haven't been, to, uh, haven't had a job. You've got ge- uh, people who are not going to school. You used to see the statistics, and and you look every year when we, when they bring out that closing the gap report, it's it's just bad news. Every year is a bad news. So I see it, it, what is good. For, uh, is good uh, for the goose is good for the gander. What has dragged most people out of poverty? And, and there's a president once who said in the United States, uh, the economy is stupid. To have an economy, I don't know anyone, any race of people in the world who have pulled themselves out of poverty, who have have, have built a strong, resilient society uh, and, and had equality and, and, and had voting rights and everything for that society, unless you have an economy. And how do you have the economy? I'll get back to Jacinda's earlier thing. Education and jobs are the key. And this is where we've got to go. We've got to get people back into work. We've got to get, you know, to go back to those elders from the 1970s who just couldn't believe that people got paid for not working. And real I'd like to uh, come Re- back to this well. excellent <laughs> conversation. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry to cut you off. I just want to wrap it up under the hour. Um, But don't go away if you're watching live. We're going to keep going without interruption. You don't need to do anything, change anything, leave the dial where it is. Um, And uh, I'm just going to wrap it up now for for the end of the video. So uh, we're going to split this tomorrow. um, And people don't have to watch a whole hour on YouTube if they don't want to. Uh, Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. It's uh, wonderful to have just so much uh, thought leaders and and contributors um, interested in a in a civil and balanced debate all in one place and the commenters uh, who are watching and tuning in uh, are appreciating a, appreciating it a lot uh, so thank you very much for that now um jacinta what were you just going to say before i cut you off then oh no i was just going to say real jobs as well like meaningful jobs not jobs that make an industry more dependent like a reconciliation council job or <laughs> you know <laughs> jobs that, that, that actually are going to um deliver something that, that make money and and give people jobs and give people are sustainable that don't require <laughs> yeah, the government right. to keep funding them <laughs> yes can, can, I, can i say something that might be uh, slightly controversial but the question was, what can I do to help Indigenous people? Yeah. Could, I, could I make this assertion? Maybe the best thing we can do to help Indigenous people is to stop trying to help Indigenous people. Oftentimes, I think wanting to help Indigenous <laughs> people is more to make us feel better than yes. to actually help them. Um, it's almost like we... we we recognise there was bigotry in the past and, and we desperately want to undo the bigotry of the past, which insisted Indigenous people were inferior, so we'll push them down. But now we insist Indigenous people are helpless, so we'll lift them up. But on both occasions, it's about us, not the Indigenous yeah. people. Maybe the best thing we can do to help our Indigenous brothers and sisters is to stop trying to help them as if they need us and to simply acknowledge we live in a great country, everyone is equal before the law, everyone has a vote, and we actually believe in your dignity 
and your ability and in your intellectual capacity to make a go of your life and to accomplish that which is in your heart. I, I think that is a, a, um, a perspective that gives our Indigenous brothers and sisters far more dignity than this continual wringing of our hands trying to work out what can we do to help. Amen. Amen. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Stop helping us. <laughs> yeah, look, look, that's um. Gonna, you go, Ellie. I was just going to say we have to stop poisoning each new generation. Like we can't keep taking little kids and telling half of them you're oppressed victims and half of them you're perpetrators of crimes that none of them committed, that happened yes. long before even their parents were alive, because that's creating a whole new cycle of racism that shouldn't exist. They should just all be this new generation. You didn't do anything wrong. You're all in it together and build a country forward instead of always reverting back to things that they're not responsible for and didn't do. They're responsible for their own actions today and what they make of tomorrow. Well, I think we're going well beyond, um, well beyond well uh, beyond digging up the past and I think we're now uh, <laughs> fabricating the past. Uh, you know, talk, talks of Captain Cook being a gen genocidal invader by um, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer of Victoria I'm like, which history books are you reading? That's not exactly the way that went. But, uh, yeah, um, certainly, look, Warren, you, you spoke about the, the first-person um, humiliation and, and second-class citizen treatment that, that your dad got and, and wanted um, to remember. What, what do you say to, to people who... Are still personally affected by that in their living memory, or, or um, vicariously through someone they know personally. One degree of separation is, is that. Like, I, I think it. I think it's unhelpful to say get over it. Um, what What is helpful to say then? I look at that generation of, of, of men and women who went through that whole period. And I spent, as I said, I spent the first 13 years of my life in that period. In that. Uh, these people were very stoic, uh, very, uh, uh, very proud, and they always built into us, do not become victims. Uh, there are huge opportunities out there for, for you to drive ahead. And they were very, very simple people, you know, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a, in a very in a bad way. I mean, get a job, get educated, get a job. Uh, uh, save your money. Uh, they're, they're of that generation, black and white people in Australia, in fact, uh, that generation. Save your money. Don't, don't, you know, don't put it on credit cards. Well, I didn't have credit cards. Uh, mm. You know, uh, and my father had this line uh, and, and he meant everything. If I walked up to him and said, what do you think of, of, uh, of, of, of David? And he'd say, he'd have two things. He'd say he's a worker or he's not a worker. And, and that meant everything. The worker guy, he, he could be the midnight man. He could be cleaning toilets. He could be collecting the, the, those sanitary tan, pans that used to be around in those old days. He could be, he could be a, a barrister and a chief justice. He could, he's working. He's contributing. He's feeding mm. his family. He's doing these things. And, and this is what that generation was, and that's why they couldn't understand this idea of being paid. To do nothing, and and they come up with that they come up with that derogatory term of sit down money. You know, you've been paid sit down money, which people call the toll. And, and it's and this is what we're losing through this whole process. When you get generation of generation of this uh, happening, you see the social breakdowns. You can see you see the problems that happen. And it's not just a, a, a Aboriginal issue. I, I can go into Western suburbs in Western Sydney uh, uh, and see where communities of generations of welfare and generations of not having a job and you can see the breakdown there. We've really got to have, you know, people talk about, you know, some of these, these uh, politicians and other people say we need truth talking. Well, let's talk about the truth. Mm -hmm. Let's not make things up like what happened about James Cook and stuff like that. There's a great article I put up, uh, and I'll do it again after tonight, uh, by uh, a... a you know, John Paul Jenke, a Torres Strait Islander bloke, and, and, he, and, he, and he went, he's a historian bloke, and he went back through the 
archives and went back through the records and he, and he gives this story, the two sides, the Aboriginal side and James Cook sailing up at the coast of Australia. And it's just amazing to read it because it is not calling people racist, it's, not, it's just presenting people as human beings. And less, less, no, matter what you, no matter what side of the fence you're on, James Cook was an incredible navigator that contributed so much to uh, navigation and to science and to, to humanity that these idiots who don't even know history come out and say, oh, he's a genocide. Well, he, he didn't do that. Other things, like I, I, there's a, on, uh, I, I got, <laughs> could you believe, I got ABC, uh, uh, you know, fact check to do this, that there's a woman on Q&A who said, an Aboriginal woman who said, oh, my, you know, uh, up until the 1967, uh, uh, Aboriginals were under the, the the Fauna and Flora Act, and we were treated uh, as as fauna. Well, you know what? There was no such act. There's no lawyer, or anyone has been. Able, and I've had uh, you know people in New South Wales University Law School. I've judges. I know a lot of them. There is no such act ever existed. Now I just sit sick and tired of people who make up things. We have a great history, and we have a bad history. Every country in the world has that. You don't have to make up things. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where we've got to get back to truth talking and we've got to uh, and, and really have that conversation because I see, so I look at some of the, some young, it's not all bad news, I see some of these young people coming through. I, I chair an edu Aboriginal Education Foundation and, and we raise money and we get kids from, from rural and remote communities or the poor suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne opportunities. To, to get an education, and 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 it's been so wonderful to do that. You know, we're, uh, we're, in ten years that we've been operating, we had a thousand kids go through that program. Twenty officers in the Australian uh, Armed Forces today, Navy and uh, and Army, come through that program. Officers, Aboriginal officers, uh, they're colonels, they're captains, and mate, uh, you you see doctors so and good. lawyers. And this is the things that make the difference. And, and this is how we're able to do this. You couldn't do this in a racist country. You mm. could not do this in, in, in an oppressive, uh, undemocratic country. The opportunities we have is, be, you know, mm. is because of the society we live in. Like I'm a Christian as well. I, I, I'm happy as a Christian to live in a secular uh, Australian democracy. Why? Because even, even though it's secular, I know as a Christian I'm, a, I'm able to have my own beliefs and do my own things. In other countries, you can't do these things. You, you try and do, practice some of this stuff in, in, in China and other places and you've got a huge amount of problems to do that. Now, as Churchill said, you know, you know and you said it earlier in regard to uh, uh, Western society, Nothing's perfect, and why mm -hmm. is it not perfect? Because human beings aren't perfect, you know. In, in, in a human being, you can have good and bad in the one person, and, and that's what human beings are. And, and But that's what makes it so great because we have uh, so, so our society, you know, Western society, uh, and I include the Japanese and the South Koreans and Taiwan people in this, and they do as well because they've been able to forge some really good democracies and moving forward, is that... It, yes, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to trip over, but we but we get up and say, "Hey, we made a mistake here. How do we get better at this?" And this yep. is why our, our societies have uh, been the world leaders in in uh, education, in health, uh, life expectancy, uh, jobs, economic development, and how we've then been able to help other countries in in the world to do that. And, and if it wasn't for the society we had. The democratic free society, you know, like I, I when I was writing my book about, uh, you know, about my family, uh, I discovered my grandfather, even though he was under the, under the, uh, the the, uh, the the New South Wales Aboriginal Protection Act, which restricted Aboriginal people from voting, he still went in and and fought, and he was enrolled. I found the enrolment papers in the archives in, in uh, New South Wales archives uh, of his enrolment in 1915. To vote, and so when these people say, "Oh, Aboriginals didn't vote," they didn't. Do uh, they a lot of people did, and they worked hard and they did things. And this is what we've got to get back to, uh, because at the moment, what we're seeing is the slowly the decay and collapse 
of some of these communities. So um, Lyle Shelton uh, wants you to run for parliament again, Warren. Um, <laughs> But he also yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to talk to I have to be, uh, go mad I think. But anyway. <laughs> he also wants to know uh, um, how do we counter the grievances of people like Linda Burney? Now let me introduce uh, a little bit more information into this discussion. How do we counter these these uh, grievances? So Richard D Natale um, adding his little bit of. Uh, uh, fuel to the fire of uh, racial tension in our beautiful nation. Um, virtue signals, sending strength and solidarity to those protesting racism and systemic oppression in the US while sending our support overseas. Those of us in Australia must also reflect on the situation at home. First Nations Australians are incarcerated at some of the highest rates in the world and face entrenched racism and disadvantage. We must demand justice for all Aboriginal deaths in custody and fight for equality. Uh, who wants to comment on that? Well, first of all, I just want to make the comment that I, I had headed the inquiry into adult prisons, and this wasn't particularly Aboriginal. This is across adult prisons in South Australia. Uh, the Weverell government appointed me as chair of that, invest, uh, that inquiry, and we looked into adult prisons about stopping recidivism and, and, and how do we stop crime because 70 percent of crime is actually by people uh, is recidivism is by people who've already been to jail and so how do we break that cycle and move forward and and i looked i looked at a whole wide range of things uh, in in that area and one thing that you know there's a lot of myths again lies if some people may say but i call them myths that are out there uh, like uh, all, uh, a lot, of all these Aboriginals are in jail because of traffic fines or, they, or, or fines or something. Like that. There's a lot of garbage. Uh, we found that uh, we found 57 percent of uh, this is in the South Australian system, so it's probably similar to other jurisdictions around Australia. Were in jail for for serious crimes, yeah. serious assault crimes, and that's not just saying assault. It's it's really vicious, serious crime. And, and over uh, uh, just about 60% of those crimes were against Aboriginal people, mm. against other Aboriginal people. Mm. And so this, 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 so we've got to have truth talking about this because if we don't have, uh, uh, one thing I've learned in life is if you don't have truth and you can't deal with truth, then you can't fix things. Mm. And, of course, aside from those um, figures, uh, it's, you know, you're much more likely to die in custody if you're, in fact, non-Indigenous uh, than if you are Indigenous. You know, we, we, we talk about um, truth-telling. Uh, well, we have to begin by actually, yeah, let's, te let's tell the whole story. Let's, let's um, look at the, the big picture here. You know, so often you hear, you know, we're the, we're the most incarcerated people on the face of the earth. Well, why is that? Why is that? And exactly for the reasons that Warren just said, because our people are committing those crimes and particularly horrible crimes. And, mm. you know, we jump up and down about deaths in custody, but far more Indigenous people die outside of custody than inside custody. And, of course, at the hands of our own loved ones. But no one is prepared to have a go at that because black on black violence doesn't matter. You know, we talk about black lives matter. It's the same in the US, more black people die at the hands of other black people, but we can't say that, you know, it doesn't fit the narrative. And, you know, going back to people like Linda Burney, well, she used the um, Flora and Fauna Act in her maiden speech to parliament. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how can you, how can you be a member of parliament and start off with a lie, um, <laughs> and and what what you know bothers me is her. Um, well, I think she's capable, but she just won't recognise any of those sorts of truths. Um, you know, she has come from a very privileged uh, background herself, uh, and yet 
I mean, you know, when she visits Central Australia, she looks like a fish out of water um, because she is just so far removed from marginalised Indigenous Australians uh, that I, I don't feel she um, certainly has an authority to speak in Parliament about the circumstances of those in remote communities because she is far removed from them. I mean, I don't know an, an Aboriginal person from a marginalised community that has a property portfolio as large as hers. Um, but as far as I know, the media doesn't do enough of a job in challenging Indigenous Australians and particularly Indigenous leaders. Uh, you know, Pat Dodson's speech, reconciliation speech of 2013, he basically ended by saying that our history will not be forgotten and not forgiven. Well, forgiveness is an integral part to reconciliation, and they call him the grandfather of reconciliation. It's yep. an integral part of uh, moving mm -hmm. forward and that is the problem is that a lot of Aboriginal people want to hold on to resentments. They do not want to, for the sake of themselves, forgive yep. someone who they don't even have to forgive anyway because they weren't responsible for our country's history. They just happen to have white skin. But they're not prepared to forgive because of the sins of our past, of our country's history, in order to free themselves. And they themselves are keeping themselves locked in, in this frame of mind, but they're poisoning the rest of Australia while they're doing it. And media is allowing them to get away with it. And those who tie the toe the line of political correctness are allowing them to get away with it um, as well. And, you know, like Warren keeps saying, let's have some truth telling. Let's lay it all out on the table. Uh, and if you don't like the truths I'm saying, um, well, let's make the rules that you can't just simply yell at me and call me names to get me to back down because, one, I won't back down, but, two, the mm. name-calling and calling people <laughs> racist for speaking the truth is a lie. <laughs> Jump in, Ellie. Well, well, <laughs> well, well uh, comments like Richard D. Atale is very similar to a lot of comments from uh, political opinionists in the US and, indeed, organisations like CNN where they make the assumption in their tweet without specifically saying it that uh, people of colour are in jail because of the colour of their skin, not because of what they may have done to be in that position in the first place. They don't mm. state it, but they make that assumption, then use that assumption in order to stir up a movement of which you can't solve. So if they want justice, well, what are you supposed to do of I want justice if people are in jail because they committed a crime? Well, what's the justice yep. there? You, do you release them? Do you not arrest them? Do you arrest more people? Do you arrest less people? It's... There's no clear exactly vision right. there what to actually do with that proposition. Yep. The, uh, one of the biggest of Africans, Americans in America is 13%. The percent of their representation in the commission of violent crimes is 39%. And if we're talking murders, it's 51%. And police are more likely to instigate a, a shooting when they're frequently encountering um, violent crimes, where violent crimes are committed more often, there's more likely to, to be a police shooting. So it, it's the, on the statistics, I think you mentioned before, Jacinta, something along these lines, um, you're actually uh, safer being, the statistics are when, when adjusted for when adjusted for the factors that you're more likely to be shot at when you're com commissioning a violent crime, Police statistically are actually more reluctant to start shooting when there's black people involved. Of course, there's lots of, of black shooting going on, and that's not to say there's not bad police who are just brutal and need to be charged and, and put in jail. That absolutely should happen. Uh, but, yeah, excellent question, <laughs> Alexandra. What is the Can solution? Can I have a really when... weird side point in? Can I just throw, we talk about forgiveness, and it's just it's interesting to see what civilization will forgive and what it won't forgive. Everybody forgave Germany for two world wars and moved on with what happened. And then they won't forgive other things. So it's just interesting to see what will be forgiven, what won't be forgiven. I mean, look mm. what the Spanish would talk about that. So I just thought that it is an interesting thing in a uh, why are some things being held on to and others not? And why can yeah. we move on from some things and not others? Yep. Oh, we've been about, about, the, 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 sorry, we've been talking about this. this. Sorry, Go ahead, know. James. We've been talking about assumptions and, and lies that are perpetuated. And, and one of the great assumptions is that past oppression is always the reason for present disadvantage. And, and that's taken as a given. 
but but it's clearly not the truth. Um, it's quite more likely that racial disparities are due more to dysfunctions within a particular community and uh, perhaps to left-wing policies that encourage particular communities to trade on victimhood uh, rather than to overcome damage that was done uh, in the past by their own pride and, and by the force of their own will. And, and this idea that if you are presently disadvantaged, it's because of past oppression, rather than an honest look at what's happening in your own community, keeps people entrenched in disadvantage. And, and that's the great assumption that uh, Richard Di Natale is making in those tweets. The, the other thing I'd say about Richard Di Natale is, is shame on him as a former national politician to watch footage of mass riots, violence, mm. looting, arson in America, and then attempt to stoke black versus white division in Australia. That, that to me is the height of irresponsibility. And someone like him who's been where he's been in public life should know a lot better than to, to try something like that. It is shameful. Uh, Warren, what are you going to add to that? I, I just... Uh, oh. I forgot what I was going to add, but it's, Sorry. you just made, you just made me think of something there you know, about a dreadful history. You know, and when we talk about truth talking, people, when they talk about the Mile Creek massacre, they talk about this horrific, and it was a horrific crime for a group of Aboriginal people were rounded up and, and brutally murdered. You know, some of them were hacked to death. But other people forget the other, the second part of the story. The second part of the story was that eight white Farmers were hung for that crime, and so uh, so so it was a really important. It's the first time that uh, uh, Europeans, uh, white people, were uh, arrested for, for the crime, and, that. and it really. It, so we've got to really start thinking. Okay, here's here's some dreadful things that happened. Can't change the past. The past is what happened. This is like with you know. And, 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 but we've got to, uh, how do we move on and how do we just, now with the, you know, someone uh, made the comment about reconciliation and now as, as a Catholic, you know, reconciliation means a, a very important thing for us, which is about, uh, you know, about truth talking, about uh, saying sorry and forgiving. And we tend to, in, we're tending this to debate, we seem to have all you, all you white people got to sorry, sorry, sorry all the time. We also got to forgive for the past, and, and and the only way you can move forward is through that 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 process of sorry. But but we've got to but we've got to talk about the truth. We've got to give the full picture, not just pick out little bits or make up stuff. Like I, I, I one of uh, my daughters, uh, she, um, her, uh, a friend of hers is at Sydney University, and. The, they had this group come in, the, the sovereignty group, the Aboriginal sovereignty group, what it is, and they and they gave this talk. And there's and, the, and, the, and her, my daughter's friend came over to our place and said, "This is what they told me." And I said, "Well, that's just a whole lot of rubbish." You know, they said things like, "Oh, you know, people on uh, Aboriginal people don't get all the full welfare payments, and the Aboriginal people don't get this and that." that. It was just absolute nonsense. And I and I sit to myself thinking, "This has been taught." at one of Australia's top prestigious universities. And you wonder why we got we got this problems about race, this problems about hatred, this problems about anger, and that when this is the nonsense that goes on there. But they you know, the also sell in universities, sorry, Warren, in universities today that people like me who have a, a, an ancestry in Europe had no problems at all coming here. Like one of my uh, ancestors, he stole a sheep because he was starving in in Scotland. He mm. was put on trial for for to feed his sister's family. He was given death or go to Tasmania. So he ended up in Tasmania in chains. It wasn't exactly his choice. He, he <laughs> oh, I would have chose death myself, but anyway, he <laughs> was there part of early Tasmania as a prisoner. And then another one who was a free settler. They were they came here because they were poor. They, it was a famine in England. They had nothing. They came to Australia with zero of anything to start with. And almost all of her family died, her children, her father, her brother, his family. These are the people that we're being told are oppressors and are violent. It's almost robbing another part of 
uh, our culture of their own culture and their own mm. past and trying to spin a complete different narrative as to what actually happened. I mean, there are terrible yeah. things and de uh, terrible things happened to everybody to build this country. And now we're all here together and we're, we're trying to go back and paint a, a picture of the past that isn't really very accurate as far as the whole history of what happened to everyone that is here. And also, and also how quickly we should be able to move on. I, I remember in the 1960s as a kid, we used to watch a TV show called Sincharo, uh, The Samurai. And, and, and it was really amazing. So this is only what, 14 years, 15, no, no, 19 years after the Second World War. Um, and, I, and I knew soldiers, who, who, old people who, who were in any prison and suffered and the brutality of the Japanese during the, in that war against uh, against the enemy and that. And here we were so quickly, 19 years later, watching these, uh, the samurai. When, that, when he came out to Australia, uh, he was mobbed by thousands and thousands of Australian people in it. So we, we were able... Uh, and look at look at our relationship with Japan. It, you could not get a, a more stronger relationship between Australia and Japan and the trading and stuff that we do. And that is only because we were able to move on. We were able to yeah. to, to to work together. And, and, and yes, we didn't hide the facts. You know, we we knew what happened to, to our prisoners of wars and the Burma Railway and what happened to them in Changi and all that type of stuff. But we were able to move on and 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 build a strong. A relationship and it was a conscious decision to move on from that point afresh yeah. and just to go forward from that point and it's built a beautiful relationship that we have with japan yes absolutely and just going back on the point of your ancestors of course my very own ancestors you know were brought over in the yeah. same way as well so you know i've got my mob running around the bush in the town of my desert and then yeah. on the other side of the, you know i've got uh, i've got my ancestors who was utterly dispossessed of their own land you know a 17 year old farm boy who was um you know sent to australia um because he had um he'd stolen um break and enter break and enter was his crime uh and you know, was was to serve out um, twenty odd years over here, but of course, no one ever went back. They were all brought over here, and then they had to mm. they had to make a life for themselves here in a completely and utterly foreign country. And you know, the thing that that gets me is the fact that so many people, uh, you know, people who identify as an Indigenous who are prepared to, you know, talk about the plight of Indigenous people but won't recognise the other ancestors that, uh, you know, that, that make up who they are, just like myself, just like Warren. And um, I was talking to a Māori um, man here in Alice Springs who was telling me about how, you know, he, he, was, he was talking to me and, and my other half, who we all know is very Scottish, um, and and was you know so proud of the fact that he had a, a Scottish grandfather, and that for the Maori you know we, they recognise all of their ancestry that their fucker papa they call it, and he was buried in the traditional way in which um, you know his Maori family were buried in the same area as them and respected because he says if it, if it wasn't for our ancestors we wouldn't be here and. Mm. You know, let's go. Let's yeah. Let's let's tell the truth. Let's tell the truth about, um, yeah. you know, what makes us who we are. And this notion that you're either Aboriginal or you're not is rubbish. It's utterly yep. rubbish. It's disregarding who you are as an individual, as a human being, and judging you based on um, your race or, or uh, an element of your race. And you know this when people say oh well think about it this way if you get a cup of tea and you pour milk in it if you keep pouring it it's still tea isn't it it's like that is the worst analogy you know eventually <laughs> it will become tea flavored milk but otherwise i, I <laughs> wouldn't drink tea flavored uh, <laughs> it's a bad analogy and it's disregarding <laughs> the fact that we're all simply human yeah <laughs> and we are yeah, and i just i have this funny story because my great great grandfather was irish and that's where my catholicism comes from my family and and i went to ireland and it doesn't come from a personal revelation from scripture yeah. and understanding yeah, of god yeah, for you on, on the way, on the way to Dubbo, yeah and uh <laughs> I, I, 
and I went to Ireland and I just thought, oh, yeah, well, I, I was on this trip and I said, oh, I might go and, you know, check out where, where my mob come from. So I went down to County Cork because that's where, where they come from. Anyway, the, I was in the pub and this, and, and, and this folk looked at me and he said, in, in his village, and he goes, he says, hey, where are you from? I said, I'm from Australia. And he said, what are, you, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, well, my great-grandfather come from here. He was a... Uh, Donovan, but uh, we call him Donovan, and I thought, and and he said that's funny. That's what we call him here too. We call him Don Donovans as well. And I thought that's just an Aboriginal way of saying it. And I said, oh, really? And I said, yeah. And then this old bloke in the corner turned to me and he said, so you're a Donovan? And I said, yeah, that's that's my mother's side there, you know, Irish, you know. And he and he said, oh yes. He said, uh, you're here to check out your ancestry, and I said, yeah, that's right. And he goes, he says, well, shout me a beer, and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> and I think this bloke's done this before. And one of the stories was that we, in the in the in the in the, the Protestant Catholic wars, and you know William of Orange and stuff like that, and Bonnie Prince Charles, we chose the Catholic side, of course, and we lost the war. And, and they said, yeah. And then you, and then so what happened is they took all the all the land off you. And I went. Ireland, they took the land off me. In Australia, they took the land off me. I'm a two land lo uh, losing person. You know. <laughs> Um, so um, talking about the culture of Australia, I wrote a piece called Cattle Class a while ago and I still have people writing into me about it because it's about the connection that, well, I'll use the term white people, are allowed to have with the Australian landscape and the land and how we are not allowed to identify as being spiritually, emotionally connected to the land of Australia. Mm. I mean, well, what other land can we be connected to? My ancestors lived and died here for as long as I know. I've barely been anywhere else. Where's my home supposed to be? And there was a real feeling of dispossession about the current generation of not being able to have attachment anywhere because it's not allowed by the new gatekeepers of our culture but who are basically saying based on the colour of your skin is whether or not you're allowed to be fully Australian or not. And I thought that might just be an interesting point that mm. I don't know what you guys mm. think about it, but this is my home as much as it, like this is the only home I have, but we're being told we're not allowed well, to. Well, I, I, I can relate mm. to the uh, disposition, the, the dispossession of land. I've got Scottish ancestors and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm surrounded looking, by bloody Scots. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking, looking for no, compensation, not Scots. sure. Not not sure who I can um, leverage the the guilt onto, but um, I actually am going to uh, put an appeal into the government of Morocco uh, because uh, one of my ancestors from County Cornwall, uh, Thomas Pello, um, was uh, had an experience as a slave uh, when he was captured as a as a young boy. Um, mm. So I've got actually slavery and land disposition in uh, my my ancestry. So. Um, that was something I found out with a great deal of excitement recently, and I'm um, <laughs> sad, sad to say I don't have any actual wounds to um, carry for that. Oh, like, Are you and, and fetus, you know, you'd be just ready to be signed up already for that. I know. I should write a book about <laughs> about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't mean to make The thing is that we are. Uh, the, the thing is, we are a, 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 a nation. Uh, if, you know, if, you know, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been here, and and we've had uh, uh, incredible migrants who have come here and helped build this nation to what it is economically and socially and everything like that. Yeah, you, know, you know, I'm glad they did because I've got sick of drinking international roast uh, coffee, and now <laughs> I can actually get some good barista stuff. And we had, and, we, and they com and they con contributed to this country and built this country. And, and I'm proud of their achievements just as much as I'm proud of my own family and, and background mm. achievements. I'm proud of my Irish. In fact, in everything I, I talk about, I always say, you know, uh, I always say, you know, I'm an Aboriginal and Irish background and that probably mm. explains my drinking habit. But, with this, but this, we should be, you know, your ancestry is your ancestry. And, <laughs> and, and, uh, and this anger and, and also people that did some great things. You look at the institutions we have in, and you think of the, the, the you know, even though we, we, we knock politicians in Parliament all the time, but, you know, the, the, you know, the Westminster political uh, uh, structure system is, is, is great. It's, it's not the best in the world, it's, but I tell you what, it's better than any other system. And yeah. uh, and you know, the the rule of law and stuff, you know, like I pointed out in 1840, you know, that, that dreadful massacre of Aboriginal people and yet the law was there to intervene and arrest those people who did that massacre and, and they got the full, full 
they were put in trial and found guilty and they were hung for that crime. Now, you know, there are some people who got away with stuff and, and that, but yeah, but, but at least we kept on trying. From that yeah. moment, yeah. we kept on trying. And, and this is what I love about Australia and, and I love about, you know, our society that we come out of and in, in go to the Western uh, society in that is that we we always keep trying. Even when we have our failing, even when we fail, when we make mistakes, we keep on trying. And this is one of the things I, I, I found interesting about America. America, can you imagine in 1776, these bunch of blokes in wigs come up with this incredible, they talk about this experiment, and it is an experiment. America is an experiment. It, it is sure. about, about human rights, about about how people are equal before the law, how people are, you know, the equality uh, that you have. Uh, it's about, you know, the individual can, has the opportunity to, to, to be rewarded for their toil, uh, the, the opportunity of development. And, and you know, it, it is, and this is why I think sometimes America is held up to this incredible uh, standard. And, some, and, of course, when you're held up to an incredible standard, you fail sometimes. And, of course, mm -hmm. they did. But you know, mm. they, they had slaves and that. But but I but I remember you know I was listening to this African American guy in Washington when I was there early this year, and he was talking about the Civil War, and he said 800,000, 800,000, these are Union soldiers, something like three hundred thousand were killed, uh, another uh, another uh, three hundred thousand were injured. You know, lost a leg. Like, could you imagine in eighteen sixty losing legs and arms and stuff like? How are you going to live and work? And, yeah. and another couple of hundred thousand were prisoners of war. So eight hundred thousand people. And I'm sure there were some races and people didn't want, uh, didn't want, were not really fighting for slavery, but they actually fought for the end of slavery. And we should never forget those eight hundred thousand people. Mm. Can, I, can I say something about this discussion of mm. ancestry? You know, one of, the, one of the great things that Christianity bought was the idea that your ancestry matters, but it's not the thing that matters most. Mm. Jesus scandalised the Jews when he said, don't think that because Abraham is your grandfather that you automatically have a right relationship with God. Your relationship with God is not based on the fact that you're children of Abraham. It's based on personal faith. And this yeah. scandalised the people of the time, but it actually made it possible for every person to enter into a relationship with God. Now, as a Christian country, one of the things that has been a benefit to everybody is that the class system, the uh, ancestry of a person, doesn't necessarily have to determine their destiny. But it's interesting to me that as our society rejects the Christian faith, all of a sudden ancestry becomes important all over again. And this is why progressivism is always regressive in nature, because as we reject our Christian roots that uh, gave us personal freedoms, we end up not going forward to something new, but going back to the chains of the past. And, and I think the emphasis or the overemphasis on your ancestry is symptomatic of that cultural shift. Yeah. I, I counteract that and say it's more Marxism than atheism. As the, a firm secular humanist, it's the <laughs> Marxism that is very keen on removing your identity and re removing uh, everything except for the ideology they want to put forward. And that is very firmly embedded in our universities and being taught to our, our children for a good 20 years now. It's been the predominant, um, basically, in replacement of religion so instead of replacing religion with a moral code, they're replacing it with Marxism, which is a political move movement, which is quite destructive, like mm. communism can. Well, well, everyone raves on about fascism and the Nazis and everything, but when you look at the track record of the of the, of communism, it, it, I, I consider them equal. In, in they the, killed more. In the yeah, they, it, I was in, when I first went to Beijing, I almost got myself in big trouble because we're having this conversation with these the, the, the local, uh, you know, uh, leaders there. In fact, I met the, the foreign minister of China and we was having dinner. And, and we got in this conversation about, the, you know, the five-year agricultural plan. And, and when they did the plan in the 1950s and early 60s, you know, something like 40 to 50 million Chinese starved to death. And I'm sitting there, and they're very open about it, they're talking about it. And I said, 
I said, what, 50, 40, 50 million people starved it? And they said, yeah. And I, and I said, so who, who made the plan? And they said, uh, Chairman Mao. And I, and I went, so the, the, the plan was bad. And I said, yeah. And 50 million people, that died. That, that's bad. And I said, they said, yeah, that was bad. I said, I said, so Mao must be bad. And they went, oh, no, no, he was a very good man. <laughs> Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> and it was one of the blokes met me, so yeah. elbowing me, saying, Warren, watch it, mate. We're going to end up in some gulag. Or something. Let's have a look at, at uh, <laughs> the Stockholm syndrome a little bit. This is probably related yeah. to this question from Janet Inglis, um, mm. directed at Warren and Jacinta, but we won't limit it. What, what do you think yeah. of Biden's assumption that the left owns the black vote? The Australian left have the same assumption, I think. Uh, probably you could extend <laughs> yeah, it to all refugees and immigrants as well. Uh, and uh, Janet has seen the affront you've yeah, both caused absolutely. to those in the left. Well, they, they do. They, uh, I, yeah, there's always, yeah, and, this is and, one of the things, why well, I left the Labor Party. Excuse me. Uh, because they, excuse sorry, me. yes. Excuse me. Well, we'll let well, the lady yeah, go first this time. The ladies first. Can I, can I, can I, uh, can, I, can, I can I have a go? <laughs> I'm, I'm using my elbows. No. <laughs> um, You're no, on full screen now, so you is, can. <laughs> <laughs> this is a huge issue when it comes yeah. to politics in Australia. Like what I'm seeing coming out of America is more and more black people coming forward and saying, um, you know what, This, this firstly, it's a racist assumption to assume that you are automatically, you automatically belong to the left if you are Aboriginal. That is, has become a racial stereotype. And of course, myself and Warren have both been called coconuts and sellouts and Uncle Toms. And in fact, you know, most of those derogatory terms, you know, as Australians couldn't even come up with their own because they had to go and recycle them from America. So that once again, not very intelligent people we're dealing with here. But it is, um, I, I'm heartened to see more and more black people coming forward in America, pointing out the the ridiculousness of, of, of the left and this assumption mm. that somehow black people belong to the left. And, but what I see here in Australia is something more sinister. I see people fearful of being publicly outspoken and being, proud to call themselves a, you know a, a conservative black person i mean my, my nephew is not one of these people he's a he's a gay conservative um aboriginal man and uh, you know he uh, but he has so many friends who are very similar you know not particularly gay but definitely you know conservative aboriginal people but people they won't come forward and say these things openly which is because there's a there's a definite sense of fear um, there because the backlash that you get like I mean it's so sad you know my, my, myself and Warren cop the backlash but you know we're strong enough and we've got the kind of support you know incredible support around us that we can stand up to the nonsense and while that is happening the left the you know and particularly Labor take advantage of that you know they they go about in remote communities. Uh, and pretend as though they're here to be the saviors of the indigenous person, and you know to to ensure that you know they're gonna all they all they promise is much of the same of what's been going on. Uh, you know th that's all they promise. They can't. They never. They never seek to make real change that is going to lift. You know, well, allow someone to lift themselves out of right. their disadvantage. And they exploit Aboriginal people in remote communities, and I've seen it over and over and over again. And when your first language is in English, when your you know education level is is extremely low, and you're you're an adult and you're illiterate, you know you cannot make an informed decision about who you're going to vote for, and you're taken advantage of because of that. I mean, I know people who just say, "Oh yeah, I'm Aboriginal. I vote for Labor." You know, that's what they've been brought up to think and believe. And, yeah, it's it's really, really disempowering and it's poisonous. Mm. Yep. Jump in, Warren. Oh, 
So it was, that, that that is true because you know you, you see, I just find it amazing that they they got this ownership. You know, talk about I know I know when I was in America uh, the, the conservative um, uh, African Americans and and Latinos and that they. They, they, they use the term, oh, they think uh, the, the Democrats think we're still slave. And also how they change history. Like, for instance, the Democrats say we are the, we are the party of the African-American. Well, go through history. Uh, who was the one who released, who fought the war and, and, and released slavery? It Republicans. Was the Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, who, who, was, uh, who was the uh, president who sent troops into the, to get uh, African Americans into the school system, that was Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a Republican, and, mm -hmm. and, and the list just goes on and on in regard to a, a number of these incredible changes. That, but the, the Democrats claim all that stuff. Uh, and so, and same in Australia. You look at you look at uh, uh, the, some of the incredible work that's been done by, uh, uh, you know, the, the conservative side of politics, the Liberals and, and the Nationals and that. And, and, and they, don't, they don't, the problem they have is they don't crow about it. This is one of the things I do know about the left. If, 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 if they do anything, there's a book and a movie made about it. And uh, the right tends to not go around with a big trumpet and say, doing things. One of the biggest blokes that made really incredible changes, and he, and he, and he was very blunt about it when he's, the title was Minister for Native Affairs, was Paul Hasler. He, he actually sat down there and they called the Native Affairs Conference in 1963 and he told the states and, and that you blokes are going to have to have to start pulling your socks up and, and, and breaking down these, these racial barriers and that. And this is when the, the, the movement was really getting a big push along. And, here's the, and, and, and who was the bloke who did the 67 referendum? It was Harold Holt and Sir Paul Haslux and they were liberals. But when you hear about the 67 referendum and how great it was, do you hear their names? Do you even know they were involved with that? I, I didn't and know. I, <laughs> and yet they were, these are, the Prime Minister was Harold Holt and, uh, and, uh, and the Minister for uh, Native Affairs, as they called it in those days, was Sir Paul Haslock. And they were there fighting for equality and civil rights for Aboriginal yeah. people. The and, Land and yet, Rights Act. The Land Rights yeah, Act. Of land land rights, rights. Yeah, it was Malcolm Fraser. So you get all this. And, and that photo of Gough Whitlam pouring the sand in the hands of Vincent Lingari, uh, get the handing back that, which I think is pretty patronising. White fellow given he's leaning back <laughs> to the bloke who owned the land in the first place, uh, was uh, was actually started by a bloke who's not recognised very good as a prime minister. And that was Billy McMahon. And how I discovered that was when I was doing my book, we went back through all the archives and stuff like that, and here was the, the paperwork we found. And, I, and, and so I wrote it, put it in the book. You know, it, was, it was Billy McMahon. But would you know that? When people talk about that, uh, that, that land rights process and handing back of the land, those names, Malcolm Fraser, Billy McMahon, do not, not mention and this is where the this is where the left really then captures that area. They say well, they sit there and go, well, you know, I, I even had an Aboriginal bloke, a young Aboriginal bloke who's graduate, doing his master's degree, said to me, he said, oh, you know, good for Labor Party. They got that sixty seven referendum. For I said, mate, they weren't even in government uh, for another six years. It was mm. it was the Liberals and uh, uh, you know Harold Holt and Sir Paul Haslock had got that. Through. Mm. Neville Bonner, Neville Bonner, first. No, Indigenous Neville Bonner, first Indigenous in Parliament. In, in the uh, Northern and, Territory, and, in the Northern yeah, Territory, yeah, is Hyacinth yeah. Tungatulum, who was part yeah, of yeah, CLP. Yeah, he was a the Liberal first, yeah, CLP. Yeah. The first, there's a, the first government in ever to be led by an Indigenous person was Adam Giles. You know, the first like, Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal elected in Queensland, uh, that was uh, Eric Durrell in, in, in the 1970s. Uh, so all these pioneers of the, were Liberals and, nas and National Country Liberal Party people. And yet, you you know, I was sitting there talking to this person, and I said, who was the first Aboriginal elected to Parliament in Queensland? And they said, oh, it must have, you know, it must have been uh, some Labor bloke. I said, no, it was Eric Durrell uh, back in 1970. Uh, 1974, and, and <laughs> I said, 
And then uh, Neville Bonham, people said, oh, yeah, he's a Labor Party. I said, no, he's not. He was a Liberal Party man. So, yep. so the left's been able to capture that story. And, yep. and, and that's how, and they, and they just spin it out. They're very good. They're very good at it. I've got to give it to them. They're yeah, very this good. This will worry you. The grandson of our education was uh, two, two pages of Woe is Me, Gough Whitlam. That was our Australian history for politics. So no yeah. wonder nobody knows anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to wrap it up in just a minute. I'm going to go around the panel and get everybody to give me their final thoughts for the evening, but just a short plug for next week's episode. We've got Andrew Cooper from uh, Liberty Works and the organiser of last year's CPAC, uh, which is the Conservative Political Action Conference uh, brought over from America to here for the first time. And uh, the uh, winner of the inaugural uh, CPAC award, I can't remember the exact name, but uh, was Christina Keneally for helping sell many, many, <laughs> many seats uh, to that conference. So Andrew Cooper will be joining us the next Freedom week. travelling the world and uh, talking about uh, CPAC in, in many other countries. He's got some excellent insights on Hong Kong he may be able to share with us. We've also, 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 also got Anthony Dillon, who's uh, got some excellent research uh, on Indigenous uh, deaths in custody. And uh, we also have Mark Powell, who is due to join us tonight, but uh, for personal circumstances that came up, um, had to reschedule to next week. Next week. But uh, we were fairly packed tonight. So uh, thank you very much for everyone for joining us. It's, yeah. it's lots of fun with uh, five guests, but with four, you'll get a little bit more of a turn. Um, so... Anthony, why don't we uh, start with you and uh, and then we'll go around to Alexandra and then James and uh, and Jacinta will give you the final word for the evening. James, uh, do you want to wait your turn or you've got to jump in? I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Anthony for the first time. <laughs> well, well I, I can understand why you confused me with Anthony Monday because we've got, we've, we've got that, that same athletic physique, uh, very similar, you yeah. Did I say something wrong? Did I say it wrong? <laughs> Did I? Call me Anthony. I've got Anthony me Dillon Anthony. on next week. That's where he got confused. Yeah. Oh, that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know that I said it wrong and I have to listen back tomorrow and go, mm. <laughs> that is so funny. Uh, yeah, it is your uh, not so good looking uh, nephew that um, is, is welcome <laughs> on the show. If you can uh, give him my mobile number. Uh, then um, yeah, that'd, be, Warren, that'd be fun to watch actually <laughs> that would be wouldn't it he'll um he, yeah. he, he, somebody else was asking for him in um <laughs> no this is uh warren mundane um sorry yeah. uh, i suppose my final comment is I suppose people saw my finger I, I hit myself with an axe today chopping wood but uh, i think somebody asked what the gloves were for i didn't know who they were talking about but yeah well i just i just you know just oh, that was you that's no, cold yeah, it's a, yeah. It's cold. Uh, my only <laughs> comment to finish off on is uh, uh, some of the people on the, on the left and other groups are calling out for uh, for truth, speaking truth. And I, and I, let's speak truth and let's move forward. Great. Short and sweet. Love it. Mm -hmm. Alexandra Marshall. Oh, well, thank you for having me on tonight. It was a pleasure. And my advice would be do not import racial tensions from other countries into our beautiful peaceful Australia and use the platforms of social media that you have to spread facts and truth and to combat the destructive narratives. And that's, thank yep. you very much for having me. Uh, awesome. And uh, I hope it's not the last time. Um, should we call you Alexandra or Ellie? What do you prefer? You may call me either. That Everyone calls me whatever they feel like, Alexandra awesome. or Ellie. And uh, Joanna Lindgren's uh, chipped in and said, don't forget who the first Aboriginal female Queenslander was <laughs> elected to federal <laughs> parliament. Neville Bonner's niece, of course. Uh, and uh, James, you, you feel free to take a little bit longer than the 15 seconds <laughs> so far for the two before you. Your final thoughts for the evening. If I can go back to a discussion we had some time ago where uh, we talked about this idea that if you're not black, you have no right to speak about mm. uh, racism because you can't possibly understand uh, what it's like. It, it sounds very humble and uh, humility is necessary, but not to the point of silence. It's, it's the same idea that if you're not a woman, you can't speak about abortion. If you're not black, you can't speak about racism. If you're not gay, you can't play a gay character in a movie or in the theatre. Uh, 
you will get to the point where no one's allowed to say anything. And, and we've got to come back to, to this fundamental premise. We need to judge ideas based on whether or not they are true, not on who they are coming from. And as Warren said, if, if we can judge ideas on their truthfulness, then we've got a great future as a society. But, but if, we, if we believe this lie that an idea is only valid uh, if it comes from the uh, approved group, uh, then um, the future looks very dark indeed. Jacinta, your uh, final thoughts for the evening. Um, okay. <laughs> Just um, what everyone else said was awesome, um, and I totally agree. But just going back to the point where you were talking about about Alexandra, about, you know, you know, if you're not Aboriginal and you were born in this country that you say somehow don't belong here is nonsense. And if any Aboriginal person tries to tell you that, tell them that's nonsense. And what I was brought up with was by the elders here in Alice Springs and one particular um, said that any children born here in this country, they have who made, he said that any all the, all the little kids that were born in Alice Springs, see, because the Arana believed that the rangers were created by the the, uh, the Yipurinya dreaming, the giant caterpillars, and when they travelled the land creating it or went back into the ground as a land formation after they finished creation, they left in the land their spiritual essence. So... What our mob believe is that when you're born or when you are conceived, where your mother first realises, you know, that you exist during the quickening, this is where your baby spirit has leapt from the ground into your mother's belly. So you hold part of the spiritual essence of this country in you. You hold the dreaming inside of you no matter what your background is. So if anyone ever tries to tell you, no, you don't belong here because of the colour of your skin. That's entirely racist and it entirely goes against what the traditional dreaming law and rules and stories tell us that have been handed down. Um, you know, what is it now? Over 80,000 years? I think it's getting stretched <laughs> and stretched every time. Yeah, and, I, and I've felt every one of those years. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know... Again, I think as Australians of all backgrounds, we have to focus on that which enriches us, that which draws us closer together, that which we recognise in others that is in within ourselves as well. And we've got to start celebrating this country for what we have in fact built together yep. because if, if we don't do that, you know, what the bloody hell are we living for? <laughs> we, yeah. we, we've got to be able to appreciate um, where we come from and understand why it is that we get people from all around the world. We get refugees. Um, you know, we, we get my other half who's, who's a, a Scotsman who's not yet become a citizen but will be, uh, <laughs> making this place their home. You know, and sometimes I think that these people, appreciate this country a lot more than some of its very own um, citizens who mm. were born here do, and that's what we've got to start doing. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Jacinta and Warren Mundine and Alexandra Marshall <laughs> and James McPherson. Uh, yeah. Next week we have Andrew Cooper, Anthony Dillon and Mark Powell, and who knows, we might find another one as well. Uh, you can support this show at davepello.com slash donate uh, with as little as $3 a month, and there's a few people who are doing a little bit more. Um, but uh, head over to davepello.com because there's not only the opportunity to become a Pello Talk partner, but you can also grab heaps of articles and past videos and, and interviews uh, that are really good. So tomorrow, Pello Talk partners are getting backstage access, seeing the before and after scenes and the first people to uh, watch the interview that I'll be doing um, with um, 
the <laughs> national, I can't remember, Liz Stora, thank goodness, <laughs> that was really nearly very embarrassing. Uh, Liz Stora is the national director of Advance Australia. Um, and so Palo Talk partners get to actually watch that live, get a backstage pass before it's all edited up and uh, the bits before and after that um, won't be available in the final interview. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for watching. Make sure you fellow <laughs> Follow all of these uh, people on uh, on Twitter um, or wherever you can find them. Um, Warren Mundine is at, how do you pronounce that, Warren? Nyungai. Nyungai. Yeah. Um, for those on the podcast, that's spelled N-Y-U-N-G-G-A-Y. Uh, and Jacinta is at uh, J Nampajimpa. Did I pronounce that close? Jacinta? We're just trying to make it easier for you, uh, David. I, I, I think uh, Jacinda's internet might be a little bit slow. Uh, so that's spelt J N A M P I J I N P A. And Alexandra Marshall is at Ellie Melly, E W L Y M E W L Y. And James McPherson is very straightforward, like all English names are to English people. <laughs> Although, Mac, is that is that Scottish, James McPherson? Oh, we've got you on mute, do we? We do. We've got you on mute. And Jacinta's definitely got her screen frozen. Um, but yeah. awesome. Well, I'll uh, sign off there. And thank you very much, one and all. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We've uh, nearly got half the people we had in the first hour still at the end of the second hour. So that's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, again, thank you very much to the Pello Talk partners. And we will – oh, Jacinta's back and got <laughs> – Got her NBN connected just in time to say goodbye. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much, and we'll see you next week at 8 p.m. Um, Sydney time on YouTube and Facebook. Bye. Bye. Thanks to meet you all. Lovely to meet you, Alexandra, James. Thank you. <laughs>